Brilliant. Okay, I think we're live on Facebook and YouTube. Welcome everyone to the Feel Inspired Podcast. I am, of course, your host, Amit Soda, the most handsome host on planet Earth, of course. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining me. I've got a beautiful guest on my show today as well, a wonderful guest. And as always, I deliberately do not get to know them too well before this because I like to kind of get them to know them on the actual podcast. Um, but for those new joining and watching, uh, this is the Feel Inspired Podcast. And I, I created this um, a uh, beautiful outlet because I wanted to help people uh, get that experience where they feel inspired to do something, to take some action, to make some changes in their life, to do the things they've always wanted to do, the, to stop putting things off. Um, because that's been the case for me anyway, at least, uh, that I've been in a situation where I read a book or listened to a podcast or seen a beautiful video and it's made me want to change. And so hopefully something you hear today or see today uh, from myself or the lovely Sarah who's joined us today, um, it might inspire you. It might give you that moment where you just feel inspired and you make the biggest change of your life. Who knows, right? So who knows where this path is going to go? Uh, without further ado, though, I'd love to introduce today's wonderful guest. Uh, she's a personal growth coach. Uh, she's an author. And I think it was energy healer, right? Absolutely. Right, yeah. Yeah. Double checking. Just double checking. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we're going to find out all about her, her journey, what she does, what she teaches. Um, and we're going to talk about a journey to self-love. And I think that this... Uh, particular subject is actually probably more important than most people realize at the moment. In fact, I think it. I would argue it's probably uh, the biggest thing uh, that people are lacking and suffering from right now with everything we see going on in the world. And I think that this is pretty evident. Um, so I think this subject is pretty all encompass encompassing, but also fundamentally important. So uh, I'm glad we're going to kind of touch upon it today. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to lo welcome lovely Sarah all the way in Australia, in Melbourne, Australia, right? Yes, Melbourne, Australia, though it's not very warm at the moment. So uh, I'm very envious of your sunshine that you've had. <laughs> Well, there's not going to be much today, but next week is looking a little bit nicer, so that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So like I said, I deliberately do not get to know my guests that well. So I wanted to hear from you about your journey of how you've gotten to where you are today from, you know, where you were. What was your lowest point? What got you to this? What, what was the moment that made you choose to take this path to become an energy healer, a growth coach? You know, what sort of events did you go through in life? What trauma did you go through? So give us like, you know, your three, four, five minute introduction. Let us know who you are and, uh, you know, what the hell you're doing here. <laughs> sure. It's lovely to be here. So thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so I will start with what I do now and then I'll sort of work backwards. That's so probably easier. So as you said, I'm a personal growth coach. I'm a spiritual mentor, an energy healer, an author, and also an advocate for shining a light on infertility, which has been a big part of my journey. And I think the thing that sort of encompasses all of that is that it's really for me about wanting to work with people to sort of find the essence of who they are, to fall in love with themselves and transform their lives. And that's the journey that I've been on and it has been fundamentally life-changing. So I came from a very sort of analytical um, background where education was the be all and end all. So I, I lived in the UK for many, many years and went to one of the best schools in the country and education was really important to my family. And so I, you know, followed that path. I went to university, I did my postgrad and then I entered the corporate world and went into HR. And I got to a point where I felt like I was unfulfilled, like there was something missing for me. And at the same time as that, I was going through this journey to try and have a second child and it wasn't working for me. And so those two sort of worlds collided at the same time. And I went on this amazing journey of self-discovery and trying to work out why I was here, what my purpose was. I was have always been very curious, even since a very small child, that there's more than the nine to five, you know, there must be something bigger than just day-to-day -day life so I sort of I guess through the crumbling of my life I found myself and even though I felt that my journey was about having my three amazing beautiful children it was actually a journey to self-love it was actually a journey to acceptance and being able to then use everything that I've learned to help people 
do the same, to grow, to experience who they are, love themselves, make positive change, accept who they are and, and really just do what they came here to do. So that's it in a sort of two, three minute nutshell, but obviously there's lots of layers underneath all of that to unpick. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that obviously, even that is quite a journey. So you started in the UK. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so now, all my family's in the UK. And so what was, the, what was the decision? What was the, where did the decision come to move to Australia? So the decision came, um, we had gone, when my son, who's now 14, um, was a baby, he was, he was actually born two months premature. And if he hadn't have been born two months premature, we wouldn't have had the opportunity, which we then were presented with, to move over to China. And so we did a period of time living in Shanghai and loved it and wanted to then do another secondment overseas. But then the UK went into recession and we knew that if we wanted to go overseas and do another two to four years somewhere, we would have to do it ourselves. So we started the process of looking into emigrating to Australia because I actually followed my intuition. There was no logic behind that decision. It was um, based on a visit to Australia a number of years prior to that where I'd literally landed in Melbourne and felt like I'd come home. I felt like my soul had come home and I literally cried. I didn't want to leave when we had to return back to the UK, which I've done a lot of travel. Travel is something I'm really passionate about, but Melbourne just really hit me. And so I had this yearning for about five years to return. And in the middle of our sort of applying to move overseas, I actually uh, went through an IVF cycle to try and have a second child and it went disastrously wrong. And I ended up in intensive care fighting for my life. We, we had actually gone over to Norway to have the treatment. So I was overseas and my son had to go home. He, he was, we were lucky that my mother-in-law had come with us on that, on that trip. And so she took him back to the UK and I lay in bed and I didn't know whether I'd ever see my little boy again. And I made a promise to myself at that point when I was literally in intensive care, there was nothing the doctors could do for me. My body was shutting down. All they could do was treat the symptoms of sort of really looking at my life and thinking, if I died today, would I have regret? Would I have lived the life that I wanted to leave, uh, to live? Or have I just sort of lived my life through other people's expectations of me and the expectations I've put on myself that society has sort of driven? And I realised that I wasn't happy to leave at that point. It was like, I've got so much more to do. And I promised myself that I wouldn't allow myself to be driven by fear anymore. I wouldn't allow fear to be the reason that I didn't do something. So when I actually recovered and I was lucky enough to be able to go home and made a full recovery, when we were sort of working through that process of emigrating to Australia, even though it made no logical sense, we were leaving the UK in a recession, we both had amazing jobs, we didn't know anybody, we had no jobs to come to. There was something in my soul that was saying, this is the right thing to do. And we followed my intuition and we moved over to Australia um, probably about five months after I recovered and began a new life. And life just began to flow. For the first time in my life, I surrendered. I let go to the universe and said, do with me what you will. I let go of the fact that I didn't think I'd be able to have another child. And everything just fell into place. And you know that feeling where everything, you don't, you don't have to work for it. It just flows because you've got out of your own way. And it was just the most amazing feeling. And I remember saying to myself, don't ever let you forget how this feels right now because this is how you need to live your life moving forward and yeah everything just fell into place and within six weeks I was pregnant with my daughter which I'd been told I would probably never have so it was a beautiful journey and I really really love it here it's it's my second home for sure well, we'll come back to that topic of surrender because I think that, that for me is probably uh, one of the, in my life, the biggest topics right now that I'm, mm. I, hate, I hate using the word working on, but just something I've come to understand better and I'm learning to surrender more and more. 
Uh, I think we'll we'll touch uh, we'll touch upon that a little bit later. Actually, yeah. I think it's such a, a valuable lesson in life in general. Um, so, what was this? What was the kind of moment that, or the 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 turning point for you that made you start this kind of work? What were you you did you did touch upon it briefly, but what were you doing before you yeah. started to do this? And what was the kind of catalyst that got you into this kind of work? Yeah, so I'd spent 10 years working in corporate HR for a really large multinational organisations. I'd worked my way up the corporate ladder. And so the obvious thing to do when I moved over to Australia was just to sort of fall back into that. In the meantime, I fell pregnant with my daughter and I realised that, you know, I'd, I'd been through so much to have her that I wasn't ready to go back to work and give her to somebody else to look after. So I took that time out for me. But in the process, my son had, um, as part of his prematurity, he'd been diagnosed with a learning difference, which was causing him some problems when he started at school. And I really wanted to find an alternative way to help him to manage his stress, his frustration, uh, and the things that he was struggling with. And that's when I, I sort of stumbled upon Reiki. So that was where it, it sort of initially started. I'd done many years of meditation prior to that in the UK. So I'd done, um, I'd gone to a Buddhist center for many years and done meditation. And honestly think that if I hadn't learned meditation, I don't think I'd still be alive because that was what got through me. You got through, you know, helped me through that period of time in hospital was listening to meditations, was breathing, was um, knowing that there was a purpose beyond the, the that present moment. So meditation was probably the key thing. And then from that, I sort of moved into Reiki, initially learned it just for myself and then realised it was so incredibly powerful that I wanted to become a practitioner and share it with other people. And it's such a beautiful healing modality. Um, and then from there, I just, I, it's, it sort of unfolded really, um, really quickly. And I embraced my creativity and I began writing and exploring this side of me that I'd suppressed for a long time because I'd felt like it wasn't really valued in society um, and wasn't taken so seriously. And I wanted to be, you know, taken seriously. And there was all those expectations from society about who you should be and what you should do when you've spent your life studying and getting all of these qualifications. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it just gave me that permission, that space when I had my daughter to be able to take a step back, do something for me, something that I loved. And then it all just naturally evolved. And I got to a point where I was like, I can't go back into the corporate world. I feel like I would be selling my soul. Mm -hmm. I need to do this work for me and I need to, to step up and I need to do this work for other people because there's something really fundamental in this. So yeah, that's where it sort of started. Would you, can you, would you say, uh, trying to phrase this the, the the way that I mean to put it but would you yeah. say like with everything that you've kind of talked about and mentioned that this whole idea of surrender has anything to do with self-love as well because I do I 100% do and I wanted to get your take on it what's what's your thoughts on that yeah I think I'd spent so much of my life prior to being in intensive care disliking my body because it didn't do what it fundamentally needed to do as a woman and I beat myself up because my medical condition meant that I couldn't have a second or third or fourth child. And I was really down on myself. And when I had that moment of realizing when I was in intensive care, you know, this could be, this could be it and something has to change. I, I fell in love with my body at that point because it fundamentally healed it, it went absolutely nuts and crazy and then, you know, almost shut down. And then it just healed with no long-term damage. And I just fell in love with my body. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. I need to pay more attention to you. I am with you. I'm with Sarah for the rest of my life. It's the only relationship that really fundamentally matters if we're really being honest about it. It's the only relationship that's guaranteed. And so I did surrender. I did sort of put my preconceptions and my analytical mind to one side and just say this is about my journey with myself you know nobody else can help me here this is about me getting out of my own way trusting the universe knowing there's a bigger purpose and just allowing things to unfold how they're meant to so absolutely I think those two things come together so beautifully 
Absolutely. Uh, I, like I said, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that this, you know, we, again, we'll kind of do a bit of a deeper dive into this as well, but it's just so fundamental um, that, that uh, and here's the thing as well, is that most people see that sort of surrendering as, you know, giving up, but it's not the same thing. It's very, in fact, it's very no. much a different thing. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's a fine distinction. So we'll kind of like look into that. You know, what is the, yes. what, how would you, how would we actually define this for people to make it very clear what the difference is that, you know, between say giving up and surrendering? Because, you know, actually it's, it is similar in what you think it is, but actually the outcome is very, very different. The feeling behind it is very different. The yeah. intention behind it is very different. Uh, and so I think that that is very, very important. What about the work you do with at the moment? What do you do in terms of your personal growth coaching? What is it that you help people with specifically? What do you what do you kind of help them with? What areas and you know what what is personal growth coaching for you? Yeah, um, I basically help people with lots of different problems. Um, so I've had people who've come to me who are unhappy in their work, or they're dealing with a lot of stress, or they're wanting to leave the corporate world and they need that confidence to do that. Um, helped people through infertility, grief, um, learning how to relax and to um, connect with nature. That's a really big thing for me and something that, again, I learned on my journey is how connected I am to the great outdoors. And we have this amazing, beautiful, free resource that's, you know, normally on our doorstep for a lot of us that just changes our energy the minute we go outside. So I do work with that. I'm very blessed to live right near uh, next to so many, be you know, beautiful, amazing beaches. And I can do sessions on the beach with clients and we can use nature to really help people connect with themselves. So a lot of it is just about um, helping people un uncover and discover who they are. So we do work around um, what people's shadow side is. We do work around who, who am I? You know, when you take away all those layers, when you take away all the job titles, when you take away, you know, mother, father, sister, brother, employee, neighbour, friend, who am I? And that can be such a, you know, confronting question for people to actually sit and think about it, particularly at the moment when everybody's going through such change and we realise that we're actually quite fragile and that nothing that we thought was stable is. It's always been that way, but it's, you know, sort of being pushed into, into our minds. It's at the forefront of our minds at the moment and we can't sort of get away from it. Um, and I do work with people like, literally as simple as looking in the mirror and learning to say, I love you, and actually getting to a point where they can say that, feel it, know it. Some people don't like themselves that come to, to see me and that work begins with really working out who that person is what their passions are and trying to help them figure out why they're here and what what brings them joy because life isn't supposed to be so hard and so complicated but we tend to overcomplicate it as humans so mm -hmm. there's so many different layers to to how I help people and I love it you know no session is ever the same in all the work that I do it's very tailored it's very you know me tuning into the person what they need on that particular day um, and what their sort of goals are and where they want to to end up as well and it all just sort of falls into place. Is there a common theme that you will uncover when you're working with people in terms of when you ask that question who am I who are you <laughs> or who am I uh, yeah. well, you know what do you find do you think a common theme or do you find that everyone's very individualistic in that respect? Most people are defined by their job, um, mm. so what they do. And when we think about it, it's not surprising because one of the questions, the, one of the first questions we ask somebody when we meet them, whether it's personally or professionally, is what do you do? We never ask who are you, what do you enjoy, what makes you tick? It's what do you do? And so we feel that we are defined by what we do and what our job title is rather than who we are as a person and what we can bring to the world and, and how we can make the world a better place and make a difference. So there's that. And then a lot of people are also defined in their roles as mother or father and provider and carer. So we have to sort of unpack, unpack that and give people permission. Sometimes people just need permission and to hear that it's okay to put yourself first, to practice self-care 
and to realise that we all have needs that need to be met so that we can continue to help to meet the needs of others. So yeah. I liken it to the analogy of, you know, you go on a plane and you put on, you know, your oxygen mask before you put on your child's oxygen mask, <laughs> otherwise you're both going down. So it's really just allowing people to break down those barriers and those beliefs and traditions that they've taken on that are not necessarily even their own from their parents from you know their from school from their neighbors whoever about putting other people before themselves so it's about reframing that as well so I think those are the two main areas that that come up a lot yeah no absolutely I think I come across a lot of that as well and what do you what do you what kind of outcomes as a result of that do people come to what kind of you know realizations do people get when you pose that question to them and they start seeing through that curtain of labels and so on and so forth what kind of realizations have you come across in people and what they sort of start to realize about themselves yeah I think for some of them it really is that massive uh, home aha moment of I've maybe heard this and I think we all have we've had all had those experiences where you've heard the same thing a hundred times but maybe you need to hear it from a different person or you need to hear it you know 101 times for it to really sink in so it's about timing too and it's about whatever point that they're at in their life and are being ready to receive that and accept that information but I think um, what I love is seeing the positive change that it has on their mental emotional physical spiritual well-being it's that whole sort of mind body spirit connection that people start to sleep better people start to actually prioritize themselves and it may be as simple as just giving themselves permission to sit down and have a cup of tea or coffee in front of the fire for 10 minutes in the morning before the children get out of bed yay <laughs> you know it's really, well, you uh, a yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly you know it's really can be that simple it's not necessarily about going on retreat for a week by yourself as lovely as that is to do and that is something that I do do but you know it it can be just those finding those small moments throughout the day mm. and just changing your perspective around what self-care is and what it isn't and that it isn't about being selfish and that it isn't about being egotistical and thinking that you're more important than everybody else it's about realizing you're just as important as everybody else and in order to be able to keep giving to those people that you love and want to support you've got to give to yourself first mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I could, again, I couldn't agree more. And it, it's, you know, there's so much to be said about doing this process and realizing actually who we truly are at our source, our core, uh, and not why we think, but why we actually are here. I think that, you know, mm -hmm. in my opinion, we're all here to remember who we really are and understand yeah. and experience ourselves as we are. Um, but obviously somewhere along the way we forget that we get we get taught out of it at school that you have to have a conventional career yeah go on yes. be a lawyer be a banker be this that the other you've got to find a way to make money otherwise you'll never survive and you know they, they, that's generally the status quo of course there's always exceptions to the rule but you know that's the majority of it for a lot of people but that's not who we are. That's not why we're here. This is not what we were put on earth to do. You know, we, we have, a, we have a, a much greater calling, each and every one of us. And um, I think part of that calling is remembering who we are. And once you remember who you are, you can go on to do the great things that you've always wanted to do or be or have or whatever it might be. Mm. Uh, and so, um, so, yeah, no, I like that. I really like that. But let's talk about a little bit about the, the self-love, though, because we talked the, the topic of today was a journey to self-love. Mm. And so what I wanted to ask you was what are the not necessarily actually, let's just go with word signs. What are the signs that someone perhaps is in a situation where they're very much not uh, in a place of self-love? And what do they need to do then to get themselves to a place where they are they are on that journey to self-love and loving mm. themselves much more? I mean, you know, I've seen it manifest in a number of different ways, but I wanted to hear your take and what you find that happens to a lot of people in terms of, yeah. you know, what they feel, what they see, what they experience, what they do, what they, how they behave, what they think, et cetera. So I wanted to get yeah. your think. Yeah, sure. I think there's a number of different sides to that. So you've got the mental side where people are very judgmental with themselves and you can hear it in the language and the way that they talk 
a lot of people will put themselves down or will be the first to criticise themselves before they feel somebody else will. So it can come through in, in sort of a judgmental, lack of confidence perspective. It can also come through in a perspective of distracting themselves from life. So potentially putting in everything into work and working ridiculous hours and not giving themselves any space and time to be able to deal with their problems or process grief or whatever it is that they're trying to sort of distract themselves from. Then there's also the physical side, which is not really looking after their body, so not getting enough sleep. Uh, not thinking about what they're putting into the body, whether that's, you know, food or alcohol or, or you know, drugs or, or whatever. So there's a number of different ways that people almost punish themselves without necessarily realising that they're doing it. And mm -hmm. some of it can just be habit. Some of it can be the environment that they've been in, the environment that they've, you know, been brought up in. Some of it is something that they've fallen into or it's become a coping mechanism. I know a lot of people struggle in the corporate world and turn to alcohol to, you know, at the end of the hard day to get through the next day. And it's really about sort of um, trying to dig a little bit deeper to find out what the root cause of those issues are and that's part of the reason that I left HR was that I felt that we were constantly putting a band-aid over people's problems and then moving them on we were never getting to the root cause of what was going on for somebody so somebody would go off long-term sick they were about to have a breakdown because they're exceptionally stressed they would have a period of three to six months leave from work and then they would come back and they would be found another job and moved into that position and lo and behold six months later they're in exactly the same position just in a different department we yeah. never really you know got to what is it in your life that is not working for you right now and how can we properly support you to change that and to make positive not just short-term change but lifelong change and for me, that was meditation. You know, when I was exceptionally stressed at work, I knew that I needed to do something to change that because work was taking over my life. I was working ridiculously long hours. I was studying at weekends. I was working weekends. I was constantly thinking about work. And when you think about how much time you spend at work, you want to be enjoying it. So for me, learning meditation was the thing that just enabled me to I liken it to having your head in a bucket of water and throughout the day you get lots of water put in in cups of water in, in this bucket and slowly the bucket's sort of filling up and you're like, oh, oh, I can't breathe. And we need to learn how to release that water out of the bucket throughout the day. And so for me, meditation, nature, yoga, those things are the, are the tools that I use to be able to release that stress. And it's a lifelong change and it's a lifelong commitment you've got to put the work in to be able to maintain it and to benefit from it. And some people are ready for it and some people aren't. So it's about being flexible and trying to find what works for each person. And meditation can be going for a walk outside for 20 minutes. You can do a walking meditation. It doesn't need to be sat for half an hour, cross-legged, you know, thinking about your to-do list and knowing that you shouldn't be thinking about your to-do list and then beating yourself up about the fact that you're thinking about your to-do list. So yeah, it's, it's, there's lots of different things that need to be uncovered. And a lot of stuff comes from childhood too. There's a lot of trauma from childhood. And this is what I work through from the energy healing stuff. It's amazing what can come up when you work with somebody and you're then given information about a specific event that's happened in somebody's life. And energetically, their body has not released that trauma. And so it's, stuck, it's been stuck in their body and it can be stuck for happy years. And then when you release that and let that go, it's amazing how that clears for that person and they deal with life differently. It's, it can be as simple as that, which is very exciting. Can you give an example? Okay. Can you give an example where that's happened for you, that you've been working with someone where you've picked up on something and it actually has been, um, you know, the trauma that they've been holding on to? Can you, have you got any examples with that? Obviously, yeah divulging any identities of course but, yeah, uh... yeah um somebody i've been working with recently um he was lying on my table and 
I was working on his stomach and I suddenly had this image and this feeling of a boy drowning, a boy drowning. And I've been in a situation myself. So we're never really, as energy healers, we're not given information we don't understand. So it has to be something that we can relate to. So having nearly drowned myself as a child, I, I can sort of picture myself there. I, you know, I can go straight into that feeling. And it wasn't actually something that he remembered at the time. And it wasn't linked to him. It was actually a child in his primary school class from years ago. But what was interesting was that when we talked about water and his, and his own relationship with water was that he had a sort of a respectful fear of water is probably the best way of describing it. And it was all linked to this situation where this little boy had drowned many, many years ago. And it was something that his sister reminded him about. So he wasn't even consciously aware of it but it had come up for a reason there was something underneath that that needed to be released and let go of so there's lots of stuff um I work with a lot of women who have never told anybody that they've had an abortion or they've had a miscarriage that can very clearly come up when I work with somebody there's a lot of shame that needs to be released around that as well so um, do you find as well when when you're in a situation like that like going back to the example you mentioned about the gentleman the the um the, the drowning uh when they've come to a point where they do start to release it do you what do do they what do they tell you is the change for them what happens to them as a result you know what's the benefit for them yeah so sometimes people can yeah, be weird word to use there what's the benefit no but what's what is the outcome of that you know what do they find um enables them to then go on to do yeah, so I think um, with energy healing, the change can be instant, so it can it can be felt there and then, and it's sort of released. With other situations, it can take time, and you don't necessarily know that you've released it until you enter a similar situation or a similar topic, and you deal with it differently. So a lot of people will start to feel a bit lighter and a bit more relaxed and certainly in situations where there's trauma. So if there's been uh, death or suicide or um, a lot of grief, then it does take a little bit of time to sort of integrate and to process. But the release that people have from that is quite amazing because sometimes it gets stuck physically in the body. And that's how our bodies sort of bring it to our attention is that we often ignore stuff, particularly if it's a mental thing, we ignore it. But when it's a physical ache or pain in our body, we're more happy to go to the doctor to get that looked at. But when we actually look at where that is in the body, it's linked to, often linked to emotions and it's linked to certain events or situations from the past or things that they're dealing with at the moment. And you can, you can heal that and you can let that go. And it's the first stage is just accepting that we can heal our own bodies. So I'm just the facilitator in that. It's the client that's actually doing their own healing. I'm just bringing it to their awareness and, and they have to be ready for it too. You know, I have people lie down on the table and they go, are you going to be able to see everything in my life? And they get really panicky and I'm like, I think we would need more than an hour for that to happen, you know, for me oh, to get this. Like, mind readers, God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot, you, your life is pretty long. I think it would take a while. So only the stuff that is ready to come up will come up and be dealt with. It's like an onion. You know, you take one layer off and then you realise that there's another layer and another layer and <laughs> you keep going. And it's, you know, it's lifelong journey. It's, um, and I think the more you go on the journey, the more you realise that there's so much you don't know and understand, but it's exciting and it's, and it's empowering and liberating to know that we can make that positive change in our life whether it's through meditation, through energy healing, through, you know, seeing a coach, whatever it is, whatever works for us, we can make such a difference in our own lives. We are the, you know, creators of our life. We can decide to do and be whatever we want to be. We just have to start believing that it's possible. So that's yeah. the starting point. No, absolutely. I think it's so true. Sometimes, the, you know, the, the, the analogy I give to people is that uh, there's a beautiful quote by, I think it's Les Brown who said it, 
which was that um, when it comes to coaching, he's, he used to say, um, you can't see the picture if you're the one in the frame. And I think this is what a coach is about, is being able to see the whole picture and, yeah. uh, and see things that individuals themselves can't see. Because, uh, you know, I think that that goes for everyone, that we, we have things that we don't see, but other people will see in us. But the, you need the right people to see it. I'm a big believer of that as well. You need to make sure you get the right coach, the right person for you. Um, so they can actually see the bigger picture without judgment and help you. Um, mm. uh, and genuinely, you know, from the, the, the right place, want to help you get to the point where you've, again, for want of a better phrase, heal or just go past it or move past something mm. or overcome something, particular challenges or even blocks or just being stuck, whatever it might be. Uh, yeah. But I really love that quote. And I think that, that for me has always summed it up the best way. Um, and that is what the situation is that you're trying to do is you, you are the, you're the person seeing the picture, you're seeing the big picture, the frame, uh, everything. Whereas the person in there is, you know, you, ca- you can't see everything. And so someone yeah. who's able to help you do that, they'll be able to kind of pick up on things that you can't as an individual. Uh, yeah. or may or not necessarily can't but maybe more difficult to pick up on mm. uh, unless you become a really good mirror of yourself um, but <laughs> one of the things that I I find and I don't know what you think about this as well is that uh, uh, what I when I'm coaching people um, one of the big indicators for me is that our self-talk is a massive reflection of our self-love uh, and you can pick up on it very quickly when you just listen to what people are saying, the words they use, how they speak about themselves, um, the language. And, you know, even if you just do a simple exercise and just get them to write down a few things, you can sort of pick up the language they're doing. So I obviously deal with a lot with dating and relationships. Uh, yeah. And I say to people, look, tell me what you think of yourself when you look in the mirror. And, you know, that that reveals so much to me. Like I, I get a sense yeah. of who they are in about two minutes. And I could tell I could tell them within about two minutes of what them speaking, what their relationships are like, because um, you start to see those patterns so quickly eventually. Mm-hmm. But it's all down to their, their habituated self-talk the way they've been speaking to themselves over and over again, and they continue to do it the way they see themselves. I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. There's something wrong with me. It's my fault. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. And it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, and I think, and I, I think again, this is kind of like, it's almost like a, a relationship, isn't it? A correlated relationship, you know, your self love is directly related to your self talk. Um, mm. uh, and, as is your self-loathing as well. So if you're <laughs> in that space where you're constantly criticizing yourself, you're constantly chastising yourself and putting yourself down like someone else would, it's no mm. wonder that you are struggling to attract someone who's going to appreciate you if that's how you see yourself. And um, uh, uh, and yeah, so I think that that for me is a massive part of it. And uh, I, I think that the challenge then is how do we begin to change your self-talk? What's the first step of a journey to self-love? Well, what, what does someone do in a situation like that? You know, how can they start to, because again, right, you know, so I think this, this is the catch 22 for people like us, the coach, coaches, mm-hmm. the people, they, they will start on a journey like this. And if they're not doing so well, they'll start chastising themselves about that as well. Right. So how do we yeah. get them to a point where they start to gradually do it, you know, and accept themselves and, do in a way that it doesn't mean they're putting themselves down even more as a result. Yeah. So I think I agree with you. It's putting that judgment on top of the judgment. So <laughs> I've worked. <laughs> isn't it? And it does. It does happen. I see it all the time. Yeah. And, and I will say to people, why are you going to add your own self-criticism to yourself when there's so many other people that are going to do it for you? Yeah, and so you know, think about everything that you say to yourself would you say half the things that you say to yourself in your head would you say them to anybody else and everybody's like no and I'm like okay so that's the starting point so a really simple thing that I do with people is one make people aware of their negative self-talk just in the conversations that I've had with them and for some of them it's like a real moment of really but bringing awareness to it, shining a light on it, takes away its power. Then it's sort of working on a pattern interrupt. So that's the first thing. So every time somebody goes down a negative self-talk sentence, it will be like, stop, how can we rephrase that? Notice it, but don't go into judgment over it, just notice it. So it's like when you're meditating 
and you know our monkey mind comes in and we start to think about our to-do list and we can then go into self-judgment about that and be like oh I'm rubbish at you know uh, meditating I I'm, I'm not good at this this isn't for me etc cetera, etc cetera. or you can do a very simple thing and you can notice it's like your thought is like a cloud in the sky and you notice it and you let it go and you move on so it's about just bringing awareness to those situations and, and being a bit softer and it does take a lot of practice it can be I, I work with people with affirmations too so about finding things to say in patterns of three throughout the day as often as possible either in your head or out loud and having a reminder for that so say if you, you're driving every time you see a red light you will say to yourself um, something positive something that you're wanting to work on and slowly in time you can feel that energetic shift within yourself it's very subtle but it does work so it's about and I love working with people who are really ready to do the work as well because like you said you'll get people that will come and, and start working with you and then they'll not see the change quickly enough or they're not exactly where they thought they were going to be and they'll either give up or they'll start becoming even more judgmental so Again, it's then about sort of delving a little bit deeper and trying to understand where that judgment has come from. And normally it's through relationships with other people. So it might be that we need to then go into the relationship that they've had with their mother or their father or their partner and try and understand that the relationship that they've had with them, they can't change that, but they can change the relationship they have with themselves moving forward. So again, it's just about trying to find out exactly what's going on for each person and that will be very unique for each person but never setting themselves up to fail so I always say to people if you're going you know don't don't say you're going to start meditating for 20 minutes every day because guess what that's probably not realistic and that's not going to happen commit to two minutes every day start with two minutes do two minutes every day for you know 21 days a month and then move on from there and pat yourself on the back and say well done because you've managed to achieve that don't you know say you're going to do 20 minutes every day and then give up after a week because then you're just adding more judgment on top of the criticism of the thing that you're trying to stop yourself from doing so yeah I think really we've got to be realistic as well about where we're at what's possible in our life and also try and make it fun too. I do try and make my, even though some of the stuff we work on is quite heavy, I really do try and make the sessions fun because life is too serious, I think, and life is too short. So I think we've got to be able to laugh, learn to laugh at ourselves a little bit too and and find the humour in life. I think that makes a big difference. Uh, so true, right? Uh, there used to be a comedian that I used to know used to say, find the funny, find the funny. And I think that that's... <laughs> You've got to be able to laugh at yourself a little bit as well, just to collapse all that sort of pressure and negativity and just putting a different, in, just, in fact, it's just a very, very powerful reframe in many ways. Um, yeah. And I think that in itself can do wonders. And in fact, that's the very reason I took up stand-up comedy actually back in 2008. You know, I did it for a number of years because yeah. um, there was so much power. And in fact, loads of comedians I know who do stand-up comedy end up, it ends up being a kind of self-therapy for them um, yeah. because they end up tackling some of the biggest insecurities or challenges that they faced or whatever. Uh, and um, and they put the humorous spin on it and you know it does what it, it does wonders for their own self-healing so I think it's a, it's a powerful medium and this is the very reason I took up comedy was to be able to laugh at myself more um and not, not in a self-degrading way or a derogatory way or you know that self-deprecating humor style but just because uh I thought it was just funny as hell that I was you know so hard on myself about certain things and I thought right let's just you know let's make fun of it a little bit so yeah, yeah. I couldn't I couldn't agree more and I think that that's so so fundamental so valuable um yeah so I was going to say that uh, I think that you you make some really good points actually about this kind of this starting point and you know this this whole you know 
you know, try, trying to do it in a very sort of gradual way that is sustainable. It's, you know, it's like the, the whole process of habit forming, right? You mentioned about meditation, doing it, you know, just a couple of minutes to, to start and then you can build up from there. Um, uh, but then obviously, you see, I know people as well who just get down on themselves no matter what they do. And, mm. you know, you can, um, the, I don't know if you found this as well, and you, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I found that there's people who are quite reverse wired in this respect, that if you try and help them in that direct way, it will flop. Whereas if you kind of get into their space a little bit and wherever they're at, start, you know, like you said, right, using a bit of comedy, but not so much, but just a little bit, getting into that space of where they're at, joining them there just for a moment, just to kind of see their world, let them know that you understand and then you can gradually navigate them out of it as well have you have you found out found that as well i think i'm really lucky in the, a lot of the clients that come to me i normally and i think the universe drives this the universe doesn't send me clients that i can't understand so normally within somebody's life there's something that connects us and connects us quite deeply and also, I think as a coach, there's a huge amount of stuff that you still need to work on yourself. You know, we're constantly evolving, constantly learning. So often I will be saying to my client the things that I also need to hear myself that week. And I will be able to laugh, you know, at myself and go, yeah, okay, you need to take this advice on yourself. At this moment in time, this client has been presented to you because you actually need to delve a little bit deeper into this particular area, whether it's spending more time relaxing or not being so hard on yourself, whatever it is. So I think we definitely need to, and I always always say to my clients two things. One, there is absolutely no judgment in this space, in this room. You are not going to get any judgment from me. Everything is obviously confidential. And two, I've got so many boxes of tissues right now that, you can cry as much as you like and there is no judgment. You need to be able to, to release and let go of the stress and the tension. And I think when people allow themselves to be vulnerable in that space, you instantly break down so many layers and so many walls that have previously been held up. And some people have come and cried in my space that have never cried in front of another person or haven't cried in so many years. So I think energetically the universe is very kind to me and they bring people to me that they really know I can help and support and nurture and, and move forward. Um, I've probably only had a couple of clients that I over the years that I've just been really like, I don't quite know what to do with you. It has been a bit of an energetic mismatch. Um, but I think it is about, and I also let people a little bit into my world so allow, to enable somebody to be truly vulnerable with me, I think I have to share part of my story and part of who I am. And so I think that really helps somebody feel connected, not feel judgment and break those walls down as well. And, you know, in the work that I do and the writing that I do and the book that I'm in the middle of um, writing, I so openly share my life. You know, I'm not somebody that is very private like I, I share my story and I share who I am and I think that helps people as well realize that there is there's just no judgment from me because we're all from the same place we all go to the same place we're all here for a reason we just need to find out what that is and and I think that's a really beautiful part of coaching and that's what I love about it is that opportunity for transformation but everybody's different and everybody needs a different approach as you say and it is just that you know bit by bit and sometimes you might feel like they've gone backwards or you might feel like you've gone backwards or you've both gone backwards in it but it's about then being open and keeping an open heart and saying no we, we still got unfinished work to do let's keep going and then there'll be that massive shift energetically or something they've surrendered to the universe and we talked about surrender earlier they've surrendered to the universe and these things that they never thought were possible have actually transpired in their life and it's like yay it's like that magical moment which is great for both of you yeah no I, I, absolutely uh, by the way what is this book you're working on at the moment are you are you able to tell people or yeah so hint? it's about my yeah it's a it's a teaching memoir so it's it's about my journey through secondary infertility it's about my life 
And it's got lots of tools and techniques and tips and things that will help from a sort of mind, body, spirit perspective, help anybody that's struggling with infertility. So it's a very raw account. It goes into all the details about every miscarriage and every hospital experience and, uh, you know, when I was in intensive care and my lowest points and the journey that I went on to self-love and how I got there because I feel that there's that's missing in the market at the moment. You've got either medical books or you've got people who tell their story, but you haven't got something that kind of gives people a, so what, how do I cope with this? How do I move forward? How do I heal? How do I have, how do I hold on to hope that one day I will be able to hold a baby in my, in my arms? And it is a really difficult journey. It's a very difficult, isolating, lonely, shame-filled experience that we just don't talk about. And it affects one in seven couples worldwide, which is the crazy thing. You know, everybody probably knows somebody who's going through infertility or will go through infertility, but we don't talk about it. So it's really just about trying to shine a light on that. And, yeah, it's very exciting. So I'm just doing the second edit at the moment and I'm just writing some meditations to go with that, some really practical stuff. And, yeah, hoping to get it published ASAP. Wow, excellent. Is it? Your, is this your first book, by the way? It is my first book, yeah. I've had lots of articles published and some of those articles um, I've also sort of touched on in the book. But, yes, it's my first book. So it's my baby that's going to be released into the world and let go and, and hopefully just help help people. I really, that's, you know, I mean, that's why the majority of us write books is to help people or to help ourselves heal or both. But, yeah, I really just want it to find the right people and to really make a difference and to just help people not feel so alone. So that's that's my plan. Is that the first of many? It will be, yes. I'm already, I'm kind of like, I've been writing it for a while now and I'm, uh, there's a part of me that's a bit over it. I'm like, okay, right, because I'm, I'm ready to write the next one. I'm like, come on, I've got all these ideas for the next one. But no, I've got to, <laughs> I've got to go through the process. I've got to invest in this one and get it out to the right people. And yeah, as you know, it's, it's a process for sure. And um, yeah, but it's very exciting. So, and it took me a long time to be brave enough to write it to be that vulnerable and there was a lot of healing in that process for me of having to go back to all the moments that were really traumatic um and that journey so yeah I've, I actually feel blessed to be able to express it and to not hold on to it anymore and just be like there's no judgment on myself anymore this is this is what happened this is and this is where I'm at now and actually you know it's kind of like when you look back at your life and you can see where all the dots joined up, but you can't see it until you're on the other side of it. It's like that. So I sort of, I read my book to myself when I'm editing it and I go, Oh, I've forgotten about that. Oh, and that meant it led to that, which led to that. Oh, the universe is so clever. They really didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> As Steve Jobs says, right. You can only see the dots looking backwards, right? Yes, absolutely. You know, I liken it to like a jigsaw puzzle where the universe knows what that picture, that jigsaw puzzle picture is going to look like. And at any one point in time, we've only got certain pieces that we can put in and we can't quite see what the puzzle is going to look like. But we just have to trust and let go, surrender to the universe that they know that that picture might not be the picture that we think we're working to or the one that we think we want, but it's the one that we need. And they've got our back and we're going to be okay so yeah it's a beautiful process absolutely so personal question for you then what, what's the legacy you want to leave on this earth or on the, the universe in fact, uh, in fact I don't even say yeah. that anymore I say what's the legacy you leave in the universe I've probably got two because you know I'm, I'm busy and I'm here for a long time so I've got stuff I need to do for sure um the first one is that I, as I've said a number of times, I want to shine a light on infertility. I want to help people to heal and to really just provide a voice for other people until they're strong enough, brave enough, ready enough to share their own voice. And the second legacy is to leave this world more peaceful than I found it. And that for me is about helping people to love themselves connect with their true essence and really work out why they're here and if we all imagine how amazing the world would be if we all loved ourselves 
all the problems that we have would just disappear. You know, it really for me is that simple. And the ripple effect of helping even one person rediscover themselves, re remember who they are, fall in love with themselves, the ripple effect for their family and their community and the people in their lives is huge. So if I can touch the lives of a number of people, hundreds, thousands of people, then that's my legacy is just to really help people connect with who they are, love themselves, transform their lives, bring positive change and just make a difference and appreciate this beautiful planet that we have. Connect with nature. You know, it's just incredible. It's And I think just through everything that we're going through at the moment, the way that Mother Nature is healing and the beautiful change that we're seeing, I just love. It's just, it's such a beautiful world. Mm. Very, very blessed to live, you know, to live here in this time. So uh, absolutely yeah and your your final thoughts then on uh, uh the message you want to leave uh, for people on their journey to self-love what would you say to people what would you, yeah, what, I'd you say, yeah i'd say it's just it's never too late to start and it's not necessarily an easy journey i'm not gonna sugarcoat it it's a lifelong commitment and there are days when you think i wish i hadn't started this because this is hard work but it is so worth it. The growth that you go through, the discovering who you are, the connection you feel, that inner peace that so many of us crave, when we really know who we are, when we really love ourselves, is there. It's already inside us. We just need to, to rediscover it. And I really would encourage people to, whatever works for them, you know, read those books surround yourself with positive people with surround yourself with people you really genuinely connect with energetically that's been really important for me as well is being mindful of who your tribe is we all have a tribe be mindful of where you put your energy because life is short and we can choose to you know to have a good time and we're, we can be here for a long time or not but yeah we, we can change those things and influence those things and just keep an open heart just keep an open heart because when we keep an open heart, energetically we attract more abundance to us, whether that's a you know, positive relationship, whether that's financial, whether that's um, beautiful career, whatever it is, when we keep an open heart, then anything is possible. It really is that simple. It's also hard. <laughs> but it really, it really is that simple and gratitude. If you want to start with anything that is really going to change your life, start with being grateful. Be grateful for the simple things that we take for granted every single day. Write them down at the end of the day or the beginning of the day. Do that for 21 days and see how differently you feel about life because abundance is around us all the time, even in this really difficult time. Everything that we need is here. We just It's inside us. We just need to trust and believe and keep going. 100%. I love it. Thank you so much for being a, a wonderful special guest on my podcast. It's been a pleasure having you all the way across the globe as well. No, uh, and you're my, yeah, you're my first guest from Australia anyway. So you, you've kind of, uh, you, you've now set the record for me in terms of yeah. my uh, most distant guest, but it's been, it's been fabulous. Thank you so much for coming on board. My pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. I really love chatting with you. It's been great. I think it's lovely just to get to know people and connect with people and get to know them on a much deeper level. And Absolutely. You know, at some point in the future, we'll definitely be doing this again, I think, and we can do an even yep. deeper dive into self-love and uh, discover a journey of self-discovery as well, I think would be a good additional add-on to this as well. I think that would be awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, Thank you so much. And to everyone watching as well, like I said, if you've uh, just joined us, you can always uh, watch the replay. But if you want to watch on the also bigger part and listen on the way to work or anything like that, the podcast will be available uh, in a little while. But I'll post up all the links so you can access it and uh, listen back on your way to work, on your run, on your jog, on your walk or wherever it is that you want to do as well. So it'll be on all the major podcast platforms. So once again, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Stay on with me as well while we end the live. But to everyone else as well, thank you. Welcome to the Feel Inspired Podcast, and I'll see you on the next episode. Catch you later. Take care. Take care.